Recording in progress. <laughs> Uncle Vanya, Act One. A country house on a terrace. In front of it, a garden. In an avenue of trees under an old poplar stands a table set for tea with a samovar, etc. Some benches and chairs stand near the table. On one of them is lying a guitar. A hammock is swung near the table. It is three o'clock in the afternoon of a cloudy day. Marina. Carolyn. Yeah, there's the stage directions, aren't there? Oh, that's it, is, you're right. Marina, a quiet grey head. So a woman is sitting at the table knitting a stocking. Astroff is walking up and down near her. Take a little tea, my son. Samara, <coughs> Sindhu, what are Then will you have a little vodka instead? <laughs> no, I don't drink vodka every day. Besides, it is too hot now. Tell me, nurse, how long have we known each other? Let me see, how long is it? Lord, help me to remember. You first came here into our parts. Let me think, when was it? Sonia's mother was still alive. It was two winters before she died. That was 11 years ago. Perhaps more? Have I changed much since then? Oh, yes. You were handsome and young then, and now you are an old man and not handsome anymore. You drink too. <laughs> yes, 10 years have made another man of me. Have made me another man. And why? Because I am overworked. Nurse, I am on my feet from dawn till dusk. I know no rest at night. I tremble under my blankets for fear of being dragged out to visit someone who is sick. I have toiled without repose or a day's freedom since I've known you. Could I help growing old? <laughs> and then existence is tedious anyway. These are senseless, dirty business, this life. And guess heavily, everyone about here is silly. After living with them for two or three years, one grows silly oneself. It is inevitable. See, what a long moustache I've grown. A foolish long moustache. Yes, I'm as silly as the rest of us. But not as stupid. No, I have not grown stupid. Thank God my brain is not addled yet. And my feelings have grown up. I ask nothing. I need nothing. I love no one, unless it is yourself alone. I had a nurse just like you when I was a child. Don't you want a bite of something to eat? No. During the third week of Lent, I went to the epidemic at Maritskoy. It was the eruptive typhoid. The peasants were all lying side by side in their huts. The calves and pigs were running about the floor among the sick. Such dirt there was, and smoke unspeakable. I slaved among those people all day. Not a crumb passed my lips. But when I got home, was still no rest for me. A switchman was carried in from the railroad. I laid him on the operating table and he went and died in my arms under chloroform. Then my feelings that should have been dead and awoke again. My conscience tortured me as if I had killed a man. I sat down and clutched my eyes like this and thought, will our descendants 200 years from now for whom we are breaking the road, remember to give us a kind word. No, nurse, they will forget. Man is forgetful, but God remembers. Thank you for that. You have spoken the truth. Enter Wojtski from the house. He has been asleep after dinner and looks rather disheveled. He sits down on the bench and straightens his collar. Hmm. <sighs> Yes, yes. Have you been asleep? Yeah, yes, very much so. Uh, ever since the professor and his wife have come, our daily life has jumped the track. I sleep at the wrong time. 
I drink wine and eat all sorts of messes for luncheon and dinner. It isn't wholesome. Sonia and I used to work together and never had an idle moment. Now, now Sonia works alone and I only eat and drink and sleep. Something is wrong. Such a confusion in the house. The professor gets up at 12, the samovar can catch boiling all the morning and everything has to wait for him. Before they came, we used to have dinner at one o'clock like everyone else. But now we have it at seven. The professor sits up all night writing and reading and suddenly at two o'clock, there goes the bell. Heavens, what is that? The professor wants some tea. Wake the servants, light the samovar. Lord, what a disorder. Will they be here long? A <laughs> hundred years. The professor has decided to make his home here. Look at this now. The samovar has been on the table for two hours and they're all out walking. All right, don't get excited. Here they come. Voices are heard approaching. Sarah Brokoff, Helena, Sonia and Telegin come in from the depths of the garden, returning from their walk. Superb, superb. What beautiful views. They are wonderful, Your Excellency. Sorry, I've lost my place. Tomorrow we should have the cover. Who's Sonia? Next to me. All right, good. Sorry, I lost my place. Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, tea is ready. Won't you please be good enough to send my tea into the library? I still have work to finish. I'm sure you will love the woods. Helena, Sarah Bukoff, and Sonia go into the house. Telegin sits down at the table beside Marina. Uh, there goes our learned scholar. On a hot, sultry day like this, in his overcoat and galoshes and carrying an umbrella. <laughs> he's, he's trying to take good care of his health. And how lovely she is. How lovely. I've never in my life seen a more beautiful woman. Do you know, Marina, that as I walk in the fields or in the shady garden, as I look at this table here, my heart swells with unbounded happiness. The weather is enchanting, the birds are singing, we are all living in peace and contentment. Ah, what more could the soul desire? Such eyes. A glorious woman. Come, Ivan, tell us something. What shall I tell you? Haven't you got any news for us? No, it is all stale. I am just the same as usual, or perhaps worse, because I've become lazy. I don't do anything but croak like an old raven. <sighs> My mother, the old magpie, is still chattering about the emancipation of woman with one eye on her grave and the other on her learned books in which she is always looking for the dawn of a new life. And the professor? <laughs> the professor sits in his library from morning till night as usual. <sighs> Straining the mind, wrinkling the brow, he write, write, write without respite or hope of praise in the future or now. <laughs> Poor paper. He ought to write his autobiography. He would make a really splendid subject for a book. Imagine it. The life of a retired professor, as stale as a piece of hardtack. Tortured by gout, headaches and rheumatism, his liver bursting with jealousy and envy, living on the estate of his first wife although he hates it because he can't afford to live in town. He is everlastingly whining about his hard lot. Though, as a matter of fact, he is extraordinarily lucky. He is the son of a common deacon hmm? Hmm? Hmm. and has attained the professor's chair, become the son-in-law of a senator, is called Your Excellency and so on. But I'll tell you something. The man has been writing on art for 25 years, and he doesn't know the first thing about it. 
For 25 years, he's been chewing on other men's thoughts about realism, naturalism, and all other such foolishness. For 25 years, he's been reading and writing things that clever men have known and stupid ones are not interested in. For 25 years, he has been making imaginary mountains out of mole hills. And just think of the man's self-conceit and presumption all this time. For 25 years, he has been masquerading in false clothes and has now retired absolutely unknown to any living soul. And yet, see him stalking across the earth like a demigod. I believe you envy him. Oh, yeah, yes, I do. <laughs> Look at the success he's had with women. Don Juan himself was not more favoured. His first wife, who was my sister, was a beautiful, gentle being, as pure as the blue heaven there above us, noble, great-hearted, with more admirers than he has pupils. And she loved him, as only beings of angelic purity can love those who are as pure and beautiful as themselves. His mother-in-law, my mother, adores him to this day. He still inspires a sort of worshipful awe in her. His second wife is, as you see, a brilliant beauty. She married him in his old age and has surrendered all the glory of her beauty and freedom to him. Why? What for? Is she faithful to her? Oh, yes, unfortunately, she is. Why unfortunately? Because such fidelity is false and unnatural, root and branch. It sounds well, but there is no logic in it. It is thought immoral for a woman to deceive an old husband whom she hates, but quite moral for her to strangle her poor youth in her breast and banish every vital desire from her heart. Vanya, I don't like to hear you talk so. Listen, Vanya. Everyone who betrays husband or wife is faithless and could also betray his country. Don't turn off the tap, Waffles. No, uh, allow me, Danny. Uh, my wife ran away with a lover on the day after our wedding because my exterior was unprepossessing. I have never failed in my beauty since then. I, I love her and I am true to her that to this day. I help her all I can and have given my fortune to educate the daughter of herself and, and her lover. I have forfeited my happiness, but I have kept my pride. And she, her youth has fled, her beauty has faded according to the laws of nature, and her lover is dead. What has she kept? Helena and Sonia come in. After them comes Madame Voitskaya, carrying a book. She sits down and begins to read. Someone hands her a glass of tea, which she drinks without looking up. There are, pe there are some peasants waiting out there. Go and see what they want. I shall pour the tea. Marina goes out. Helena takes a glass and sits drinking in the hammock. I've come to see your husband. You wrote me that he had rheumatism, and I know not what else, and that he was very ill, but he appears to be as lively as a cricket. He had a fit of the blues yesterday evening and complained of pains in his legs, but he seems all right again today. And I got over here 20 miles at breakneck speed. No matter though, it's not the first time. Hey, hey, hey. Once here, however, I'm going to stay until tomorrow. And at any rate, sleep. Quantum status. Oh, splendid. You so seldom spend the night with us. Have you had dinner yet? No. Good. So you'll have it with us. We dine at seven now. Oh, this tea is cold. Yes, the samovar has grown cold. Don't mind, Monsieur Ivan. We will drink cold tea then. I beg your pardon. My name is not Ivan, but Ilya, ma'am. Ilya Telegan, or, or Waffles, 
as I am sometimes called, on account of my pockmarked face. I, I am Sonia's godfather, and his excellency, your husband, knows me very well. I now live with you, ma'am, on this estate, and perhaps you will be so good as to notice that I dine with you every day. <laughs> He's a great help, our right-hand man. Dear godfather, let me pour you some tea. Oh, oh. What is it, Grandmother? I forgot to tell Alexander. I have lost my memory. I received a letter today from Paul Alexevich in Kharkov. He has sent me a new pamphlet. Is it interesting? Mm, yes, but strange. He refutes the very theories which he defended seven years <laughs> ago. It is appalling. <laughs> There's nothing appalling about it. Drink your tea, Mama. It seems you never want to listen to what I have to say. Pardon me, Jean, but you have changed so in the last year that I hardly know you. You used to be a man of settled convictions and had an illuminating personality. Oh, yes. I had an illuminating personality, which illuminated no one. I had an illuminating personality. You couldn't say anything more biting. I am 47 years old. Until last year, I endeavoured, as you do now, to blind my eyes by your pedantry to the truths of life. But now, ah, if you only knew, if you knew how I lie awake at night, heartsick and angry, to think how stupidly I have wasted my time when I might have been winning from life everything which my old age now forbids. Uncle Vanya, how dreary. You speak as if your former convictions were somehow to blame, but you yourself, not they, were at fault. You have forgotten that a conviction in itself is nothing but a dead letter. You should have done something. Done something? Not every man is capable of being a, a writer perpetuum mobile like your Herr Professor. What do you mean by that? Mother, Uncle Vanya, I entreat you. I'm silent. I apologise. I am silent. What a fine day. Not too hot. <sighs> a fine day to hang oneself. Telegin tunes the guitar. Marina appears near the house calling the chickens. <laughs> what did the pe peasants want next? The same old thing, the same old nonsense. Chick, chick, chick. Why are you calling the chickens? The speckled hen has disappeared with her chicks. I'm afraid the crows have got her. Telegan plays a polka. All listen in silence. Enter workman. Is the doctor here? Uh, excuse me, sir, but I've been sent to fetch you. Where are you from? The factory. <laughs> Thank you. There is nothing for it then but to go. Uh, Damn it, this is annoying. Yes, it's too bad, really. You must come back to dinner from the factory. <clears throat> no, I won't be able to do that. It will be too late. Now, where, where? Look here, my man. Give me a glass of vodka, will you? Where, where? <clears throat> One of the characters in Ostrov's plays is a man with a long moustache and short wits <laughs> like me. However, let me bid you farewell, ladies and gentlemen. I should be equally delighted if you would come to see me someday with Miss Sonia. My estate is small, but if you are interested in such things, I could show you a nursery and see there, whose like you will not find within a thousand miles of here. My place is surrounded by government forests. Forrester is old and always ailing, so I superintend most all work myself. I've always heard that you are very fond of the woods. 
Of course, one can do a great deal of good by helping to preserve them, but does that not interfere with your real calling? God alone knows what a man's real calling is. And do you find it interesting? Yeah. Oh, extremely. You are still young, not over 36 or seven, I should say. And I suspect that the woods do not interest you as much as you say they do. I should think you would find them monotonous. No, the work is thrilling. Dr. Astroff watches over the old woods and sets out new plantations every year. And he's already received a diploma and a bronze medal. If you will listen to what he can tell you, you will agree with him entirely. He says that forests are the ornaments of the earth, that they teach mankind to understand beauty and attune his mind to lofty sentiments. Forest, forests temper a stern climate and in countries where the climate is milder, less strength is wasted in the battle with nature and the people are kind and gentle. The inhabitants of such countries are handsome, tractable, sensitive, graceful in speech and gesture. Their philosophy is joyous, art, science blossom among them. The treatment of women is full of exquisite nobility. <laughs> oh, bravo, bravo. Uh, all that is very pretty, but it is also unconvincing. So, my friend, you must let me go on burning firewood in my stoves and building my shed on planks. <laughs> you can burn peat in your stoves and build your sheds of stone. Oh, I don't object. Of course, the cutting wood from necessity. But why destroy the forests? The woods of Russia are trembling under the blows of the axe. Millions of trees have perished. The homes of the wild animals and birds have been desolated. The rivers are shrinking, and many beautiful landscapes are gone forever. Why? Because men are too lazy and stupid to stoop down and pick up their fuel from the ground. Am I not right now? But who would a, would a stupid barbarian, who but a stupid barbarian could burn so much beauty in his love and destroy what he cannot make? Man is endowed with reason and the power to create, so that he may increase that which has been given. But until now, he has not created, but demolished. The climate is spoiled and the earth becomes poor and ugly every day. <laughs> I read irony in your eye. You do not take what I'm saying seriously. And, and after all, it may very well be nonsense. But then I pass peasant forests that I have preserved from the axe will hear the rustling of the young plantations set out with my own hands. I feel as if I had some small share in improving the climate. And that if mankind is happy a thousand years from now, I would have been a little bit responsible for that happiness. But I plant a little birch tree then I see it budding into young green and swaying in the wind. My heart swells with pride. And I... Uh, yo. Hmm. I must be off. Probably it is all nonsense anyway. Goodbye. He goes towards the house. Sonia takes his arm and goes with him. When are you coming to see us again? I can't say. In a month? Astrov and Sonia go into the house. Helena and Wojtski walk over to the terrace. You have behaved shockingly again, Ivan. What sense was there in teasing your mother and talking about perpetuum mobile? And at breakfast, you quarreled with Alexander again. Really, your behavior is too petty. But if I hate him? You hate Alexander without reason. He is like everyone else and no worse than you are. Ah, if you could only see your face, your gestures, how tedious your life must be. It is tedious, yes, and dreary. You all abuse my husband and look on me with compassion. You think, poor woman, she is married to an old man. 
how well I understand your compassion. As Astroff said just now, see how you thoughtlessly destroy the forest so that there will soon be none left. So you also destroy mankind and soon fidelity and purity and self-sacrifice will have vanished with the woods. Why cannot you look calmly at a woman unless she is yours? Because the doctor was right. You were all possessed by a devil of destruction. You have no mercy on the woods or the birds or on women or on one another. I don't like your philosophy. The doctor has a sensitive, weary face, an interesting face. Sonia evidently likes him and she's in love with him and I can understand it. This is the third time he has been here since I've come and I've not had a real talk with him yet or made much of him. He thinks I'm disagreeable. Do you know, Yvonne, the reason you and I are such friends? I think it is because we are both lonely and unfortunate. Yes, unfortunate. Don't look at me that way. I don't like it. How can I look at you otherwise when I love you? You are my joy, my life, and my youth. I know that my chances of being loved in return are infinitely small, do not exist. But I ask nothing of you. Only let me look at you. Listen to your voice. Hush! Someone will overhear you. They go towards the house. Let me speak to you of my love. Do not drive me away. This alone will be my greatest happiness. <laughs> this is agony. Delagan strikes the strings of his guitar and plays a polka. Madame Voitskaya writes something on the leaves of her pamphlet. The curtain falls. Proceed with Act Two. Is that right? Yes. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Act two. Act Two. The dining room of Sarah Brokoff's house. It is night. The tapping of the watchman's rattle is heard in the garden. Saray Bokov is dozing in an armchair by an open window, and Helena is sitting beside him, also half asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Who is there? Is it you, Sonia? It is I. Oh, it is you, Nelly. The pain is intolerable. Your shawl has slipped down. Let me shut the window. No, leave it open. I'm suffocating. I dreamt just now that my left leg belonged to someone else. And it hurt so that I woke. And then believe this is gout. It's more like rheumatism. What time is it? Half past 12. I want you to look for Matushka's works in the library tomorrow. I think we have it. What is that? Look for Matushka tomorrow morning. We used to have him. I remember. Why do I find it so hard to breathe? You're tired. This is the second night you've had no sleep. They said that the Ganyev got the giant of the heart from Yap. I'm afraid I'm getting a giant too. Uh, <coughs> damn this horrible, accursed old age. Ever since I have been. Old, I have been hateful to myself, but I'm sure grateful to you as well. You speak as if we were to blame for your being old. I am more hateful to you than to anyone. Helena gets up and walks away from him, sitting down at a distance. You're quite right, of course. I'm not an idiot. I can understand you. You're young and healthy and Beautiful, longing for life. And I'm an old dotard, almost a dead man already. Don't I know it? Of course. I see that it is foolish for me to live so long. But wait, I shall soon set you all free. My life cannot drag on much longer. 
You were overtaxing my powers of endurance. Be quiet for God's sake. It appears that thanks to me, everybody's power of endurance is being overtaxed. Everybody is miserable. Only I am blissfully triumphant. <coughs> oh, yes, of course. Be quiet. You are torturing me. I torture everyone, of course. This is unbearable. Tell me, what is it you want me to do? Nothing. Then be quiet, please. It is funny that everybody listens to Ivan and his old idiot of a mother. <coughs> but the moment I open my lips, you all begin to feel ill-treated. Can't even stand the sound of my voice. Even if I'm hateful, even if I'm a selfish tyrant, haven't I the right to be one at my age? Haven't I deserved it? Haven't I, I ask you, the right to be respected now that I'm old? No one is disputing your rights. The wind is rising. I must shut the window. We shall have rain in a moment. Your rights have never been questioned by anybody. The watchman in the garden sounds his rattle. <laughs> I've spent my life working in the interests of learning. I am used, I'm used to my library, the lecture hall, the lecture hall, to the esteem and admiration of my colleagues. Now I suddenly find myself plunged into this wilderness, condemned to see the same stupid people from morning till night and listen to their futile conversation. I want to live. I long for success and fame and to and stir the world. And here I am in exile. Oh, it is dreadful to spend every moment grieving for the lost part, to see the success of others, and sit here with nothing to do but fear death. I cannot stand it. It is more than I can bear. You will not even forgive me for being old. Wait, have patience. I shall be old myself in four or five years. Sonia comes in. Father, you sent for Dr. Astrol, and now when he comes, you refuse to see him. It is not nice to give a man so much trouble for nothing. What do I care about your Astrol? He understands medicines about as well as I understand as, as astronomy. We can't send for the whole medical faculty, can we, to treat your gout? Don't talk to that madman. Do as you please. It's all the same to me. What time is it? One o'clock. It is, it's stifling in here. Sonia, hand me that bottle on the table. Here it is. <laughs> no, not that one. Can't you understand me? Can't I ask you to do a thing? Please don't be captious with me. Some people may like it, but you must spare me if you please, because I don't. Besides, I haven't the time. We are cutting the hay tomorrow and I must get up early. Witsky comes in dressed in a long gown and carrying a candle. A thunderstorm is coming up. Ah, here it is. <clears throat> Go to bed, Helen and Sonia. I've come to take your place. <sighs> no, no, no. Hey, don't leave me alone with him. You don't. Oh, no. <laughs> you will begin to lecture me. Oh, but you must give them a little rest. They have not slept for two nights. Then let them go to bed, but you go away too. Thank you. Floor you to go. Rest for the sake of our former friendship. Do not protest against going. We will talk some other time. Our former friendship. <laughs> our former Hush, Uncle Venya. My darling, don't leave me alone with him. He will begin to lecture me. Oh, this is ridiculous. Marina comes in carrying a candle. You must go to bed, nurse. It is late. I haven't cleared away the tea things. Can't go to bed yet. No one can go to bed. They're all worn out. Only I enjoy perfect happiness. 
What's the matter, Master? Does it hurt? My own legs are aching too. Oh, so badly. You've had this illness such a long time. Sonia's mother used to stay awake with you and wear herself out for you. She loves you dearly. Old people want to be pitied as much as young ones, but nobody cares about them now. Come, Master, let me give you some linden tea and warm your four feet for you. I shall pray for you. Oh, let us go, Marina. My own feet are aching so badly. Oh, so badly. She and Sonia lead Serebrakov out. Oh, what is that? Sonia's mother used Sonia's to wear. Mother? Yeah, Marina's part Marina. didn't finish. There's more. Marina. Carol. Carol. <laughs> Sarah Bacroft, Sonia and Marina go out. Okay, Sarah, Sarah Bacroft, Sonia and Marina go out. Do you see it, Carolyn? Helena, I'm absolutely... Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we, we were skipped. doing We that. skipped. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm absolutely exhausted by him and can hardly stand. You are ashamed by him. And I, I am exhausted by my own self. I have not slept for three nights. Something is wrong in this house. Your mother hates everything but her pamphlets and the professor. The professor is vexed. He won't trust me and fears you. Sonia is angry with her father and with me and hasn't spoken to me for two weeks. I'm at the end of my strength and have come near bursting into tears at least 20 times today. Something is wrong in this house. Uh, leave speculating alone. You are cultured and intelligent, Yvonne, and you surely understand that the world is not destroyed by villains and conflagrations, but by hate and malice and all this spiteful tattling. It is your duty to make peace and not to growl at everything. Oh, help me first to make peace with myself, my darling. Let go. Go away. Soon the rain will be over and all nature will sigh and awake refreshed. Only I am not refreshed by the storm. Day and night, the thought haunts me like a fiend that my life is lost forever. My past does not count because I frittered it away on trifles and the present has so dreadfully miscarried. What shall I do with my life and my love? What is to become of them? This, this wonderful feeling of mine will be wasted and lost as a ray of sunlight is lost that falls into a dark chasm and my life will go with it. I am, as it were, benumbed when you speak to me of your love and I don't know how to answer you. Forgive me, I have nothing to say to you. Good night. <gasps> If you only knew how I am tortured by the thought that beside me in this house is another life that is being lost forever. It is yours. What are you waiting for? What accursed philosophy stands in your way? <gasps> understand, understand. Ivan, you are drunk. Perhaps, perhaps. Where is the doctor? In there, spending the night with me. <laughs> Perhaps I am drunk. Perhaps I am. Nothing is impossible. Have you just been drinking together? Why do you do that? Because in that way I get a taste of life. Let me do it, Helena. You never used to drink and you never used to talk so much. Go to bed. I'm tired of you. Oh, my sweetheart, my beautiful one. 
Leave me alone. Really, this has become too disagreeable. Helena goes out. A pause. <sighs> she is gone. I met her ten years ago at her sister's house when she was 17 and I was 37. Why did I not fall in love with her then and propose to her? It would have been so easy. And now she would have been my wife. Yes, yes, we would have both been waked tonight by the thunderstorm and she would have been frightened. But I, I would have held her in my arms and whispered, don't be afraid, I am here. Oh, enchanting dream. <laughs> so sweet that I laugh to think of it. <laughs> but, but my God, my head reels. Why am I so old? Why won't she understand me? I hate all of that rhetoric of hers, that morality of indolence, that absurd talk about the destruction of the world. Oh, God, how I've been deceived. For years, I have worshipped that miserable, gout-ridden professor. Sonia and I have squeezed this estate dry for his sake. We have bartered our butter and curds and peas like misers and have never kept a morsel for ourselves so that we could scrape enough pennies together to send for him. Oh, God, I was proud of him and his learning. I received all his words and writings as inspired. And now, now he has retired. And what is the total of his life? A blank. He is absolutely unknown and his fame has burst like a soap bubble I've been deceived I see that now basely deceived Astrop comes in he has his coat on but is without his waistcoat or collar and is slightly drunk Telegan follows him carrying a guitar play but everyone is asleep play Telegan begins to play softly. Are you here alone? No women about? No. That is cold, the fire is dead. Where shall the master lay his hand? Whoa. The thunderstorm woke me with a heavy shower. What time is it? Oh, the devil only knows. No, I thought I heard Helena's voice. She was here a moment ago. What a beautiful woman. Yeah, medicine. What a variety we have. Prescriptions from Moscow, from Kharkov, from Tula. Yeah. Why have she been pestering all the towns of Russia with this gap? Is he ill or simply shamming? Oh, he is really ill. Oh, what is the matter with you tonight? You seem sad. Is because you are sorry for the is it because you're sorry for the professor? Leave me alone. You are in love with the professor's wife. She is my friend. Already? What do you mean by already? A woman can only become a man's friend after first having been his acquaintance, then his beloved, and then she becomes his friend. <laughs> What vulgar philosophy? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I must get a bit. I'm getting vulgar. But then, you see, I'm drunk. I usually only drink like this once a month. <laughs> At such times, my audacity and temerity know no bounds. I feel capable of anything. I attempt the most difficult operations to do them magnificently. <laughs> the most brilliant plans for the future take shape in my head. I'm no longer a poor fool of a doctor, but mankind's greatest benefactor. I evolved my own system of philosophy. And all of you seem to crawl at my feet by so many insensible microbes. Play waffles. Oh. My dear boy, I, I would with all my heart, but do listen to reason. Everybody in the house is asleep. Play! Telegan plays softly. I want a drink. Come, you still have some brandy left. 
And then as soon as it is day, you will come home with me. You yes. see Sonia, who comes in at that moment. Uh, I beg your pardon, I have no collar. He goes out quickly, followed by Telegan. Uncle Vanya, you and the doctor have been drinking. The good fellows have been getting together. It's all very well for him. He's always done it. But why do you follow his example? Looks dreadfully at your age. Age has got nothing to do with it. <laughs> when real life is wanting, one must create an illusion. It is better than nothing. Our hazel cut and rotting in this daily rain. Here you are, busy creating illusion. You have given up the farm altogether. I've done all the work alone until I'm at the end of my strength. Uncle, your eyes are full of tears. Tears? Nonsense. There are no tears in my eyes. You looked at me then, just as your dead mother used to, my darling. Ah, my sister, my dearest sister, where are you now? Ah, if you only knew. If you only knew. If she only knew what, Uncle? My heart is bursting. It is awful. No matter though, I must go. He goes out. Dr. Astro, are you awake? Please come here for a minute. In a moment. <laughs> he appears in a few seconds. He has put on his collar and waistcoat. What do you want? Drink as much as you please yourself if you don't find it revolting, but I implore you not to let my uncle do it. It is bad for him. Very well. We won't drink anymore. I'm going home at once. That is said. It will be dawn by the time the horses are harnessed. <laughs> it's raining. Wait till this morning. The storm is blowing over. This is only the edge of it. I must go. And please, don't ask me to come and see your father anymore. I tell him he has gout and he says it is rheumatism. I tell him to lie down and he sits up. <laughs> he refused to see me at all. He has been spoiled. Won't you have a bite to eat? Yes, please. I believe I will. I love to eat at night. I'm sure we'll find something in here. They say that he's made many great, uh, great many conquests in his life and that women have spoiled him. Here's some cheese for you. They stand mm. eating by the sideboard. Mm. Oh, I haven't eaten anything today. Your father has a very difficult nature. He, he takes a bottle out of his pocket. <laughs> <Yeah. May I? laughs> we are alone here. Can I, I, and I can speak frankly. Do you know? I could not stand living in this house for even a month. This atmosphere would stifle me. There's <laughs> your father, entirely absorbed in his books and his gout. <laughs> There's your uncle Vanya with his hypochondria, your grandfather, and finally your stepmother. What about her? A human being should be entirely beautiful. A face. The clothes, the mind, the thoughts. Your stepmother is, of course, beautiful to look at. But don't you see? She has nothing but sleep. Does nothing but sleep and eat and walk and bewitch us. And that is all. She has no responsibilities. Everything is done for her. Am I not right? And an idle life can never be a pure one. However, I may be judging her too severely. Like your Uncle Vanya, I am discontented. So we're both grumblers. Aren't you satisfied with life? I like life, sad life, but I hate and despise it in a little Russian country village. As far as my own personal life goes, by heaven! There is absolutely no redeeming feature about it. Haven't you noticed? If you go riding through a dark wood at night and see a little light shining ahead, how you forget your fatigue and the darkness and the sharp twigs that whip your face. I work. Do you know? No one else in the country works. 
Fate beats me on without rest. At times I suffer unendurably and I see no light ahead. I have no hope. Yeah. <laughs> I do not like people. It is long since I've loved anyone. You love no one? Not a soul. I only feel a sort of tenderness, your old nurse, for old time's sake. The peasants are all alike. Ah, stupid, living dirt. And the educated people are hard to get along with. One gets tired of them. All our old friends are petty and shallow and see no farther than their own noses. In one word, they are dull. <laughs> Those that have brains are hysterical, devoured with a mania for self analysis. They whine, they hate, they pick faults everywhere with unhealthy sharpness. They sneak up to me sideways, look at me out of a corner of the eye and say, that man is a lunatic. That man is a windbag. If they don't know what else to label me with, they say, I am strange. I like the woods. That is strange. I don't eat meat. That is strange too. Simple natural relations between man and man or man and nature do not exist. He tries to go out. Sonia prevents him. I beg you, I implore you not to drink anymore. Why not? It is so unworthy of you. You are well bred. Your voice is sweet. You are even more than anyone I know, handsome. Why do you want to reassemble the common people that drink and play cards? Oh, don't, I beg you. You always say that people do not create anything, but only destroy what heaven has given them. Why, oh, why do you destroy yourself? Oh, don't, I implore you not to, I entreat you. I won't drink anymore. Promise me. I give you my word of honour. Thank you. I am done with it. You see, I'm perfectly sober again. And so I shall stay till the end of my life. Mm. But as I was saying, life holds nothing for me. My race is run. I'm old and tired. And I'm trivial. My sensibilities are dead. I can never attach myself to anyone again. I love no one and never shall. Beauty alone has the power to touch me still. I am deeply moved by it. Helena could turn my head in a day if she wanted to. But that is not love. That is not affection. He shudders <laughs> and covers his face with his hands. What is it? Nothing. During Lent, one of my patients died under chloroform. It is time to forget that. Tell me, doctor, if I had a friend or a younger sister, and if he knew that she, well, loved you, what would you do? Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I should do anything. I should make her understand that I could not return her love. However, my mind is not bothered about these things now. I must start at once if I'm ever to get off. Hey, goodbye, my dear girl. At this rate, we shall stand here talking till morning. Hey, hey. <laughs> I shall go out through the sitting room because I'm afraid your uncle might detain me. He goes out. Not a word. His heart and soul are still locked from me and yet for some reason I'm strangely happy. I wonder why. <laughs> I told him that he was well-bred and handsome and that his voice was sweet. Was that a mistake? I can still feel his voice vibrating in the air. It caresses me. Oh, how terrible it is to be plain. I'm plain, I know it. As I came out of church last Sunday, I overheard a woman say, she's a dear noble girl, but what a pity she's so ugly, so ugly. Helena comes in and throws open the window. 
The storm is over. What delicious air. Where's the doctor? He is gone. Sonia. Yes? How much longer are you going to sulk at me? We have not hurt each other. Why not be friends? We've had enough of this. I myself, let us make peace. With all my heart. Has Papa gone to bed? No, he is sitting up in the drawing room. Heaven knows what reason you and I had for not speaking to each other for weeks. Who left the sideboard open? Dr. Astroff has just had supper. There's some wine. Let us seal our friendship. Yes, let, let us. Out of one glass. So, we are friends, are we? Yes. I've long wanted to make friends, but somehow I was ashamed to. Why are you crying? I don't know. It is nothing. There, there. Don't cry. Silly, now I'm crying too. You are angry with me because you seem because I seem to have married your father for his money. But don't believe the gossip you hear. I swear to you, I married him for love. I was fascinated by his fame and learning. I know now that it was not real love, but it seemed real at the time. I'm innocent, and yet your clever, suspicious eyes have been punishing me for an imaginary crime ever since my marriage. Peace, peace. Let us forget the past. You must not look so at people. It is not becoming to you. You must trust people or life becomes impossible. Tell me truly, as a friend, are you happy? Truly, no. I knew it. One more question. Do you wish your husband were young? <laughs> what a child you are. Of course I do. Go on, ask something else. Do you like the doctor? Yes, very much indeed. <laughs> I have a stupid face, haven't I? He's just gone out and his voice is still in my ears. I hear his step. I see his face in the dark window. Let me say all I have in my heart, but no, I cannot speak of it so loudly. I'm ashamed. Come to my room and let me tell you there. I seem foolish to you, don't I? Talk to me, Kim. What can I say? He's clever. He can do everything. He can cure the sick and plant wood. It is not a question of medicine and woods, my dear. He is a man of genius. Do you know what that means? It means he is brave, profound, and of clear insight. He plants a tree and his mind travels a thousand years into the future and he sees visions of the happiness of the human race. People like him are rare and should be loved. What if he does drink and act roughly at times? A man of genius cannot be a saint in Russia. There he lives cut off from the world by cold and storm and endless roads of bottomless mud surrounded by a rough people who are crushed by poverty and disease. His life one continuous struggle with never a day's respite. How can a man live like that for 40 years and keep himself sober and unspotted? I wish you happiness with all my heart. You deserve it. As for me, I'm a worthless, futile woman. I've always been futile in music, in love, in my husband's house, in a word, in everything. When you come to think of it, Sonia, I'm really very, very unhappy. Happiness can never exist in this world for me, never. Why do you laugh? I'm so, I'm so happy, so happy. I want to hear music. I might play a little. Oh, do, do. I could not possibly go to sleep now, do I? Yes, I will. Your father is still awake. Music irritates him when he is ill, but if he says I may, then I shall play a little. Go, Sonia, and ask him. Very well.
she goes out. The watchman's rattle is heard in the garden. It is long since I have heard music, and now I shall sit and play and weep like a fool. Is that you rattling out there, FM? It is I. Don't make such a noise. Your master is ill. I'm going away this minute. He says no. The curtain falls. That incredible. Isn't that an amazing piece of work? Ah, oh, Those pesky Russians. <laughs> I do too. I'm not going to well. comment until you stop recording. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yes. Well, I will stop recording. <laughs> um, now then, will we we're going to call it a day at this point and have a little talk about it? Isn't it isn't it isn't it lovely when uh, Helena says happiness can never exist for me in this world, never.